Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Real Engineering, where we look at movies and TV shows with both surprisingly good and laughably bad depictions of engineering. This time, to celebrate the monetization of the channel and the launch of my Patreon, we'll be looking at one of my all-time favorite movies, 1983's The Right Stuff. Based on the book by Tom Wolfe and written and directed by Philip Kaufman, The Right Stuff chronicles the dawn of the U.S. space program, from the breaking of the sound barrier in 1947 to the last Project Mercury mission in 1963. It explores the cult of celebrity surrounding the Mercury 7 astronauts, contrasting their personalities and experiences with those of countless test pilots who didn't make it into space, yet carried on in obscurity, putting their lives on the line every day in order to push the envelope just a little bit further, all the while asking, what is the right stuff? That near-mythical blend of fearlessness, intuition, and coolness under pressure that every test pilot and astronaut is said to possess. The film opens with narration explaining a dire problem faced by pilots in the 1940s as the aircraft flew increasingly faster and higher. There was a demon that lived in the air. They said whoever challenged him would die. Their controls would freeze up. Their planes would buffet wildly. And they would disintegrate. This demon, known as compressibility, was caused by the formation of shockwaves on the aircraft as it neared the speed of sound, or Mach 1. If these shockwaves formed on the wings, they could cause extreme buffeting and a shift in the wing's center of pressure, leading to a sudden pitching down of the nose, known as Mach Tuck. If they formed on the hinges of the horizontal stabilizers, they could cause the elevators to become unresponsive, sending the aircraft into an unrecoverable dive. During World War II, the problem of compressibility in high-speed fighters like the Lockheed P-38 Lightning was dealt with by installing special dive recovery brakes, but this was only a temporary solution. If aircraft were to fly safely above 400 miles per hour, the aerodynamics of transonic flight had to be understood. Though pilots spoke of a sound barrier, a mythical upper limit to manned flight, Engineers knew that many objects, such as rifle bullets, were stable at supersonic speeds, and that with the new technologies of rocket and jet propulsion, humans could also theoretically fly faster than sound. The problem was, the traditional tool of the aerodynamicist, the wind tunnel, was unreliable at transonic speeds due to the shockwaves reflecting unpredictably inside the tunnel. The only way of studying flight at these speeds, then, was to build a special manned research aircraft. So in 1944, the U.S. Army Air Force and the National Advisory Council on Aeronautics, or NACA, contracted the Bell Aircraft Company to design such an aircraft, called the XS, or Experimental Supersonic-1. Patterned on the shape of a 50 caliber machine gun bullet, the XS-1, later renamed the X-1, was powered by a reaction motor's XLR-11 rocket engine burning alcohol and liquid oxygen, and producing 6.7 kilonewtons of thrust. While the aircraft was originally designed to take off under its own power, delays in the development of a high-speed turbo pump for the fuel forced engineers to switch to a pressurized gas-fed system. The necessary pressurized gas tanks and plumbing added a full ton to the aircraft's weight and reduced the size of the propellant tanks, meaning it now had to be air-launched at altitude from a Boeing B-29 or B-50 mothership and make a dead-stick landing once its fuel had been consumed. While the film gives a fairly accurate outline of the X-1 program, right out the gate it makes a glaring historical error by implying that numerous test pilots were killed flying the X-1 prior to the first supersonic flight in 1947. In reality, no pilots died flying the X-1, though three were nearly killed in explosions late in the program. On August 22, 1951, the X-1D suffered an explosion in its oxygen tank while being prepared for launch and had to be jettisoned from its RB-50 mothership. On November 9th of that year, the X-13 was being defueled following a captive flight when it also exploded, destroying it and its mothership and badly burning pilot Joe Cannon. Finally, on August 8, 1955, the X-1A exploded while being prepared for launch, pilot Joe Walker barely managing to clamber out before the aircraft was jettisoned and destroyed on impact with the ground. These explosions were eventually traced to the use of leather seals in the engine oxidizer system impregnated with the chemical tricresyl phosphate, which becomes unstable on contact with liquid oxygen. This flaw also made its way into the subsequent Bell X-2 Starburster, leading to the death of test pilot Gene Skip Ziegler and B-50 crew member Frank Wolko in an in-flight explosion on June 27, 1952. And guide the men who fly through the great spaces in the sky. 
Following the funeral of an unnamed test pilot, we are introduced to the primary setting of the first third of the film, Edwards Air Force Base, the Army Air Force's test flying establishment in the Mojave Desert. Interestingly, these scenes were actually shot on location at the real Edwards, lending it an extra air of authenticity. Though, in 1947, the base was still known as Muroc Field, not being renamed Edwards until two years later. Further adding to the film's authenticity is its depiction of the Happy Bottom Riding Club, the storied test pilot watering hole run by the aviatrix and adventurer Florence Pancho Barnes, played here by Kim Stanley. The life of the real Pancho Barnes is worth a whole movie unto itself, but the right stuff does a good job of depicting quirks widely attributed to Barnes, such as hanging the pictures of dead test pilots behind the bar, and... First fellow to break the sound barrier is gonna get a free steak with all the trimmings. It is at the Happy Bottom Riding Club that we are introduced to one of the film's primary protagonists, legendary World War II fighter ace and test pilot Captain Charles E. Chuck Yeager, played by Sam Shepard. Yet, after putting so much effort into building an authentic setting, the film descends once more into dubious historical territory, especially in this exchange. Well now, maybe it can't be broke. Then again, maybe it can. Maybe it can only be broke for a specified sum. How much? One hundred and fifty thousand. Come on, Slick, give us a break. Non-negotiable, as usual. Hey there, Jaeger. Sir? We were just talking to uh, Slick here about the sound barrier. Do you think you want to have a go at it? I might. Uh, since, as you say, this sound barrier doesn't really exist, uh, how much... How much you got? No, I'm just joking. The Air Force is paying me already. Ain't that right, sir? Well, sure, Jaeger, but... So when do we go? Well, how about tomorrow morning? I'll be there. This is utter nonsense. The character of Slick here is meant to be Chalmers Slick Goodlin a civilian test pilot working for Bell Aircraft who flew the X-1 when the project was still being run by NACA. The X-1 was first flown by Jack Woolhams and Tex Johnson, but after Woolhams' death in an air racing accident in 1946, Goodland took over and made the first powered flights in the X-1 over Muroc Field. Goodland would fly the X-1 a total of 26 times before the project was taken over by the Air Force on June 24, 1947. While the Air Force did claim that Goodland had demanded $150,000 in hazard pay for every minute spent above Mach 0.85, Goodland vehemently denied this. In reality, the Air Force had grown impatient with the conservative pace of the NACA program, which increased the speed of the aircraft by only 0.02 Mach per flight. It was also seen as better for publicity if an Air Force pilot was the first to break the sound barrier, hence why Jaeger was assigned to the project. He most certainly wasn't chosen on a whim and sent up the next morning because Goodland chickened out and got greedy, as depicted in the film. Indeed, though the pace of the Air Force program was faster, Jaeger still made 11 test flights, 3 gliding, 8 powered, before his record-breaking attempt, gradually increasing his speed and testing out the aircraft's controls with each flight. These flights proved crucial to Jaeger's eventual success as they proved the effectiveness of the X-1's all-moving tailplane, which allowed him to maintain pitch control after shockwaves rendered the elevators inoperative. The next incident depicted in the film, however, actually did happen. On the evening of October 10, 1947, Jaeger was riding out in the desert when he was thrown by his horse and cracked three ribs on his right side. Fearing he would be grounded, Jaeger kept the injury secret, though he still faced a major problem. In order to reduce drag, the X-1 had been fitted with a flush, non-opening canopy, and had to be entered through a removable hatch on the starboard side. With his cracked ribs, Jaeger did not have the strength on his right side to close the hatch locking handle. So, along with friend and flight test engineer Jack Ridley, played here by Levon Helm, yes, the drummer from the band, Jaeger fashioned a handle from a section of broomstick which he concealed in his flight jacket and used to close the hatch handle using his left hand. Speaking of Jack Ridley, one historic character conspicuously absent from the film is test pilot Bob Hoover, Jaeger's lifelong friend and later legend on the airshow circuit. Hoover served as chase pilot for most of Jaeger's X-1 flights, the two even engaging in mock dogfights during some of the early glide tests. Finally, we come to Jaeger's historic flight on October 14, 1947, when he became the first pilot to exceed the speed of sound in level flight. 
While depicted in the film as a harrowing experience in which Jaeger encounters wild buffeting and is presumed to have disintegrated when observers on the ground hear his sonic boom, in reality the flight was surprisingly mundane. Though Jaeger did experience some buffeting, he was easily able to keep control of the aircraft until, upon reaching 0.98 Mach, the Mach meter jumped off the scale and the buffeting suddenly stopped. It was not until later, when the sealed Fédération Aeronautique Internationale, or FIA, instruments were removed from the aircraft and examined, that it was confirmed that Jaeger had indeed broken the sound barrier. Though as the film accurately depicts, this classified military secret was not revealed to the public for nearly eight months. No, sir. No press. What? No word of this is to go beyond the flight line. What's going on here? This is big news. We need coverage of this. No, sir. Sorry. No press. Those are orders. National security. Of the flight, Jaeger would later say, People were real surprised that we had done it, and to find that my ears didn't fall off or anything. And that evening, as promised, he also enjoyed a free steak, courtesy of Pancho Barnes. Before we move on, there's one extremely nitpicky thing to point out in this scene. While the film depicts Jaeger controlling his engines using toggle switches on the instrument panel, in the real X1, this was done using a lever mounted on the control yoke. The XLR-11 rocket engine was not throttleable, but it did have four rocket chambers which could be ignited in any combination in order to control the thrust. The film then skips through the following six years, depicting the growing rivalry between test pilots like Jaeger and Scott Crossfield to reach higher and higher supersonic speeds. We're also introduced to future Mercury astronauts Leroy Gordon, or Gordo Cooper, played to perfection by Dennis Quaid, and Virgil I. Gus Grissom, played by Fred Ward as the descend on Edwards take part in the action. In real life, however, neither Cooper nor Grissom were stationed at Edwards during this period, and certainly not after 1957 when the recruitment of astronauts began. Another thing to note here is that the real Gordo Cooper acted as advisor on the film, meaning that most of Quaid's dialogue is based on things Cooper himself recalled saying, including... He's the best pilot you ever saw. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at it, baby. While the film depicts the exploits of Jaeger, Crossfield, and others as a pure competition to attain the highest speed, the reality was somewhat different. All the X-planes were designed to investigate very specific aspects of high-speed flight and help develop technologies for military aircraft, and attempts at flight records were strongly discouraged. Scott Crossfield's aircraft, the Douglas D-55A-2 Skyrocket, was commissioned by the U.S. Navy to investigate control issues particular to swept-wing aircraft, such as uncommanded pitch-up at high subsonic speeds, and the high-speed aerodynamics of external stores like missiles and drop tanks. Crossfield actually had to petition his superiors to be allowed to fly past Mach 2, and the aircraft had to be specially prepared for the attempt, the fuselage being waxed and the fuel chilled so more of it would fit in the tanks. Indeed, of the D-558's 303 total flights, Crossfield's record-breaking flight of November 20th, 1953, was the only one in which the aircraft exceeded Mach 2. Yet despite this official policy against record-breaking, the Navy tried to challenge Jaeger's claim to the first supersonic flight. According to contemporary FAI rules, to qualify for a record, an aircraft had to take off and land under its own power. This technicality, the Navy argued, disqualified the air-launched X-1, and meant that the first true supersonic aircraft was the Navy's own jet-powered Douglas D-5581 Skystreak. In order to prove the Navy wrong, on January 5, 1949, Chuck Yeager performed the only ground takeoff in the X-1, firing all four rocket chambers at once. The tremendous acceleration ripped off the X-1's flaps, but Yeager managed to maintain control and pull the aircraft into a near-vertical climb. After only 90 seconds, he broke the sound barrier at an altitude of 23,000 feet, both proving the Air Force's point and setting a long-standing climb record. Not that it really mattered, as not only had the FAI readily recognized Jaeger's original record, but the D-5581 had only broken the sound barrier once, in a dive. The first aircraft capable of both breaking the sound barrier in level flight and taking off and landing under its own power would be the North American F-100 Super Sabre, which first flew in May 1953. When we rejoin Jaeger, he is preparing to make a test flight in the Bell X-1A, an improved version of the X-1 designed to investigate flight at speeds in excess of Mach 2. Though powered by the same XLR-11 rocket engine as the original X-1, the X-1A was larger in order to carry more fuel and featured a regular step canopy and an ejection seat. 
Following Scott Crossfield's Mach 2 flight, the Air Force authorized Jaeger to try and beat the Navy's record, which he achieved on December 12th, reaching a speed of Mach 2.44 at an altitude of 74,700 feet. Shortly thereafter, however, the X-1A careened out of control and entered a violent flat spin. As depicted in the film, Jaeger cracked the canopy with his helmet and was momentarily knocked unconscious, the aircraft plummeting to an altitude of 25,000 feet before Jaeger came to and regained control. The incident was later attributed to the phenomenon of inertial coupling, in which at high speeds the inertial forces acting on the aircraft, i.e. its momentum, overcome the aerodynamic forces acting on the wings and control surfaces, rendering it uncontrollable. Upon recovering from the spin, Jaeger asked Jack Ridley, what's next? And the film cuts to the launch of Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite, on October 4, 1957. Here the film makes another minor but baffling error by identifying Sputnik's launch site as Star City. While Star City is a real cosmonaut training center located just outside Moscow, Sputnik and all subsequent Russian spacecraft were in fact launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. With the space age having arrived, the film now enters its second act. Tune in next time as we explore the dawn of the space race and the birth of the U.S. manned space program, only on our own devices.